Hello, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Yeah? OK. Uh, so welcome to the Center for Migration and Refugee Studies seminar series. I'm Dr. Usha Natarajan. I'm the Associate Director of the Center, and I'm also an Associate Professor of International Law at the American University. Um, we are very fortunate to have here with us today Dr. Ronwin Manby, who will be presenting on statelessness and nationality in Africa, the case of Egypt in a comparative perspective. Uh, let me start by telling you a little bit about Ronwin and also an exciting new project that we're, we're commencing together with her. So Bronwyn is based at the LSE at the London School of Economics and Political Science and she's a senior visiting fellow at the Center for the Study of Human Rights as well as the Middle East um, Center at the LSE. And she is a leading authority on nationality law and statelessness in Africa. She's written on a wide range of human rights issues in Africa. Uh, with particular, inter particular interest in South Africa, as well as Nigeria, um, especially the Niger Delta region, um, where the oil industry is focused. Uh, recently, her um, research and writing have focused on the issue of statelessness, uh, comparative nationality law, and, and legal identity. Um, she's worked closely with UNHCR on its global campaign against statelessness, and has also advised the World Bank Initiative on Identification for Development. Um, in the past, Bronwyn's worked for the Open Society Foundations, where she founded the African Governance Monitoring and Advocacy Project, uh, which is an initiative to monitor and strengthen compliance with the African Union's commitment on good governance and human rights. Uh, she was previously the Deputy Director of the Africa Division of Human Rights Watch, um, where she worked for 11 years, and she's also worked for human rights organizations in, in South Africa. Bronwyn has degrees from Oxford University and Columbia University. She's qualified as a solicitor in England and Wales and has a doctorate from Maastricht University Faculty of Law on, on focusing on uh, citizenship and statelessness in Africa, the law of, and politics of belonging. Um, we at CMRS are particularly happy to be commencing a collaboration with Bronwyn and with the LSE Middle East Center on a new project for reducing statelessness in, uh, in North Africa. Uh, in which we're also partnering with like-minded colleagues in uh, Morocco at the Association Marocaine d'Etudes de Recherche sur l'Immigration, which is a MEREM for short. The project aims to promote recognition um, and respect of the rights of children and adults uh, to documents that uh, officially confirm their identity and nationality. Um, both in the host state, and in this case we're focusing on Egypt and on Morocco, um, and the state of origin through consular um, services and so on. And through such documentation we can contribute to the redu reduction of statelessness in the region. Um, so in the context of beginning this collaboration, it gives me you know, particular pleasure to welcome uh, Bronwyn here to Cairo and to the American University. Um, and we look forward to, to hearing thoughts on the topic. Thank you. Where do I put it on? I think it's on. That's on. Good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for the introduction, Usha. Um, I am going to talk uh, about uh, the case, how Egypt fits in an African perspective, uh, since uh, my understanding is there's a lot of Egypt in, an, in a Middle Eastern perspective around these issues, in which context uh, Egypt doesn't look uh, so bad, actually. But in the African context, Egypt is, is one of the countries that has more challenges, uh, we say, around questions of, of statelessness. And there are some quite positive developments on the African continent that I'd like to highlight, which are not well known, I think, internationally yet. So first of all, why is statelessness important? And if you think in your own lives how often and increasingly one has to show an ID to do anything, but also how often that ID has to show what nationality you have. And you can start imagining how, how difficult life is without one. I, for example, have left my passport at the hotel and had to phone uh, Norhan to come and fetch me to bring me into this space because I didn't have an ID with me, which is a very trivial example. But you know, more, uh, you know, more generally, um, you know, if you don't have an ID that shows uh, nationality and legal migration status, and by definition you will not have a, a legal migration status unless you have proof of nationality 
either of that country, in which by definition you have a legal migration status, or of another country which enables you to apply for a visa, you will not have access to all sorts of services, including healthcare, including education, including the right to uh, rent property or buy property, especially to buy property. Travel is obviously hugely difficult if you don't have documents. You are almost necessarily going to be, uh, in the context of, of migration, you are, you are necessarily going to go through illegal channels if you do not have a document showing your nationality in this day and age where having a passport is a necessity. Children who don't have birth registration and other documents around their identity are at particular risk of trafficking. And the uh, document over on the far right is a cover of a report by Lawyers for Human Rights in South Africa about detention of stateless persons uh, in immigration detention. And that is a problem that exists in every country. Uh, typically, you have a situation where somebody who is either believed to be a foreign national or who is nationality is not clear, the country where they are living decides you know, that they are there illegally and tries to deport them. Um, and then they cannot, the country to which they are trying to deport them says, we don't know them. Um, so in Britain, just uh, last week, there was a decision, in fact, this was a judicial review, so the High Court, not even just a Home Office decision, saying that 45 months of immigration detention was, they refused to, 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 to give the person, uh, to say that that was illegal and to give them protection as a stateless person. So, so a huge problem that uh, is very, is largely invisible. The size of the problem is hard to know, but for those people who find themselves in this situation, it, it dominates their entire life, removes them outside the realm of, as the famous saying of Hannah Arendt said, the right to have rights, as your as citizenship is the first basis of, of everything. And the last one I haven't you know, mentioned here, I mean, in, many, in several countries, if you do not have ID, you will not even be able to get married. Um, you know, just you're legally married and therefore your children legally recognized. So there are so many areas where statelessness is important, and yet many people working on these different issues don't conceptualize statelessness as being an underlying problem that they need to look at. So then what are we actually talking about when we say statelessness is important? And there is a definition of a stateless person in international law which is the 1954 convention relating to the status of stateless persons, which says a stateless person is a person not considered as a national by any state under the operation of its law. There's a 20 page document or thereabouts, uh, the expert document published by uh, UNHCR considering this. So 20 pages looking at this sentence. So starting uh, you know, what does a person, that's a human person, is relatively okay, we can understand that. Considered, what does considered mean? Does considered mean you're carrying a document, or does it mean that you're being treated as a national for all purposes, but you have, uh, wh there's a whole area around that. What does a national mean in the context where some countries have different categories of national? Which category is it? I mean, both the US and the UK have different categories of national. Which one is it that you have to have not to be stateless? What is a state, of course, uh, is the Palestinian Authority a state, for example, which is the most, the most obvious context, but Western Sahara is another one. Are you stateless if you are a national of Western Sahara or of the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic? which issues documents. What is your status there? So there's a, this is an apparently innocent and self-explanatory phrase which has a huge amount of ambiguity and discussion underneath it. And I just need to digress here because otherwise it will be the first question, is that as I talk here, I'm going to use nationality and citizenship as synonyms, which, tr which they are used as in international law. In different legal traditions, the two words and their cognates in different languages are used differently. So in the African context, typically the Francophone countries refer to nationality when the Anglophone countries refer to citizenship in their national laws. Lusophone countries uh, go, with, uh, go, with, go with France there. Uh, and in the Arabophone countries, the term used is jinsia, which is 
the equivalent of nationality rather than the equivalent of citizenship. I'm using these to be synonyms, but it's always one has to be aware that in each language these words have slightly different connotations. Nationality often meaning something around ethnic cultural identity, and citizenship means something about participation and rights. But in this context, I'm using them to mean the same thing. Um, and in international law, the term usually used is nationality, but just to clarify as I go along. What, you know, there is a right based on birth in the territory, but it's not applied at birth. So there are mixtures of that type. The Francophone countries in West Africa or commonly have the rule where if you are born in the country and one of your parents was also born in the country, then you are automatically a national of Senegal, for example, <laughs> uh, to a, a system known as double your soli. Um, and the very common presumption, which doesn't exist everywhere, but that if you are an un abandoned baby and nobody knows anything about your parents, then you should be presumed to be a citizen. So it is if you were a citizen from birth, but obviously you know, the, the facts about your birth are not known. So, the, so the, this, this distinction, but if you, if you get nationality at birth, it's often a much more secure status and it's attributed automatically. There's no requirement of good character for a newborn baby, for example. Um, whereas acquisition after birth often does have that, those types of, uh, of issues. And this you know, varies. Every country has different rules. Um, but typically, acquisition, if you are married to a citizen, is uh, relatively simple. Acquisition, if you are adopted by a citizen, is relatively simple, but again, not always, and some countries do not have provisions providing for nationality related to adoption. Um, long residence, almost all countries have a, have a provision, at least in theory, allowing you to acquire nationality based on five or ten years residence, but often that's very discretionary, and there are a whole set of other rules applied, um, so it's very difficult to acquire, and quite a number of countries have rules that allow you to acquire based on you know, special contributions. Uh, the, perhaps the most notorious example of that is the Comoros, which is in essence uh, taken money from the Gulf states to grant its nationality to the Bedouin, who are being given Comoran nationality essentially for cash. But it's not their personal cash, it's the, uh, it's the Gulf states have paid the Comoran government to give them a document, um, but uh, which is regarded uh, is legal in international law, but increasingly frowned upon to do that type of thing. So with these rules, sometimes people fall through the cracks, um, and we'll come to the, to, the, to the reasons why that is the case, but you have this situation in which every country sets its own rules, and every country is thinking, but who, but who deserves to be Egyptian? Who deserves to be British? Who deserves to be Nigerian? But they're not thinking about the people who have a connection to several different countries and what their rules should be to apply for them. And you have, in these cracks, that's where you find the stateless people. Um, in international law, the interesting, the, the nationality in international law, if you go back to the 19th century, in essence, the international law around nationality ar arose or was developed partly in discussion between the European states and the United States of America about how did people transfer nationality and were they still German if they were also American and if they went back to Germany and committed a crime and the Germans arrest them, could the Americans exercise power on their behalf? And, so that, the, 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 and then also in the context of the European colonial empires where you suddenly had a m massive uh, dispersion of people around the world and the question of who belonged where and who could exercise authority on behalf of whom, and not just people but also companies, and how could you decide who had jurisdiction. So international law around nationality arose in that context, and it arose in connection with defending the interests of states. It had absolutely nothing to do with the rights of the individuals. It had to do with the rights of the states to exercise authority over that individual. So in that context, the initial assumption was that it was important that everybody should have a nationality because everybody, every state should know which state was in charge of this person. It was, dual nationality was not a good idea uh, because you weren't sure about the loyalty. 
Uh, and there were also, you know, statements about, well, what if a person is required to do military service in both countries? That's unfair. So there was some regard to the rights of the persons concerned, but essentially it's about how do we make sure that the states know who's in charge here. But also stateless people were a problem because then who was going to exercise authority of them? Who was going to say, well, yes, we have to take them back to our country and deal with them if they were a problem in some way? So the, 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 the international law on nationality, which was first codified in 1930, so an early multilateral treaty, uh, which basically the Article 1 says it is for each state to determine who are its nationals, but then there are some basic protections, including protection for uh, unknown children of unknown parents, Gender discrimination was assumed that uh, men transmitted nationality and women acquired the nationalities of uh, their husbands. Um, but there were some rules about you know, not, not leaving a woman stateless in between that. And then, as with most other international law, everything changes with uh, the uh, establishment of the UN and the Universal Declaration. And Article 15 of the UN Declaration establishes the right to a nationality. Of course, in the context where the first of many uh, abuses against the Jewish population of Germany was the denationalization of them as German citizens. Uh, and that realization that, and indeed Hannah Arendt saying the right to have rights, the denationalization of the Jews was the first part of uh, the first step towards the extermination. Then immediately after the war, um, uh, also in, in that initial uh, uh, phase of, of, of standard setting, uh, there was a convention on relating to the status of, sta of stateless persons, which provides the definition that I've already mentioned, which is a, 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 tw it's a mirror of the refugee convention. If you follow it, the structure is almost identical to the refugee convention, uh, and in addition, in, 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 indeed, in the first instance, they were actually going to put the two in the same document, and it became separated because of the sort of conceptual difficulties about this realization that, of course, there were, you know, there were literally millions of people around the world, but especially in Europe at the end of the Second World War, they weren't facing persecution in the sense of the refugee convention, but it wasn't clear where they belonged and how could you actually stabilize this population and give people a place to belong and create a route for them to be protected. Uh, and then the, 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 there are two international conventions on statelessness. The first one is this one relating to the status of stateless person. And then in 61, we have the Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness, which provides certain very minimum basic rules about reducing statelessness, of which the most important uh, is that a child born in the territory who would otherwise be stateless should acquire the nationality of the state where he or she is born. Um, and so that's trying to eliminate multi-generational statelessness. That if the, so either if the parents are stateless or if the parents cannot transmit nationality to their child, then the child should have the, state, the nationality of the, status, of the state of birth. There are also limits on loss of nationality and the avoidance of statelessness in, in loss of nationality as well. But that's the sort of framework there set in, in, uh, around nationality. Now, those are the, the specific documents on nationality we have a whole set of other international law documents now, the whole infrastructure of human rights law, in which, the, uh, which have developed since. And how they interact exactly with protections on statelessness is still an area in active development, really, in international law. But on the one hand, the uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the Convention on the Rights of Migrant Workers all say that every child has the right to acquire a nationality. And then uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and on the Rights of Persons with uh, Disabilities talk about non-discrimination. Now, the Convention on uh, Racial Discrimination is complicated as well because it also has an exception that uh, you know, it states that uh, nationality should be attributed without discrimination on the basis of race, um, creed, color, and so forth. But then it also says that it, you know, the nationality, by definition, requires some forms of discrimination because it's admitted that it comes through your parents. Therefore, there is a discrimination there. You're not saying everybody in Egypt is Egyptian. There are connections to parents that are relevant. And that 
you know, the, the Convention on Racial Discrimination acknowledges that and says that rules on citizenship are exempt, but then it also, the committee has provided some interpretative guidelines. So the extent to which discrimination in nationality is allowed or not is still, I would say, it's not really very clear uh, and how that should work. Um, and it's an area of increasing concern. I mean, you look at the more recent statements by the committee, it's uh, the, the concern about how this discrimination works. But it's also the case, of course, that discrimination between citizens and non-citizens is permitted as well in some contexts. And the extent to which discrimination between citizens and non-citizens is permitted is also an area of tension in international law. So on the one hand, can you discriminate in attributing your citizenship? And then how much can you discriminate between your citizen and the state's own citizens and other people? Uh, international law leaves still quite a lot of leeway for discrimination, but the extent of that discrimination is under development. We also have the Human Rights Council has had over the last several years, um, biannual resolutions around arbitrary deprivation of nationality, which has arisen especially in the context of, of some terrorism concerns. And we have the International Law Commission has done some standard setting in this area as well, especially around uh, nationality in the context of state succession, by which I mean when, when a territory, when one state breaks up to become two countries, like Sudan becomes Sudan and South Sudan, or Yugoslavia splits up into five countries, the former Soviet Union, or indeed the end of the European empires as well. So what happens in that context? Uh, there is some standard setting, but no treaties at this point. Well, there are at the European level, but not at the international level. So moving on to the situation in Africa, these three maps are fairly obvious. The first one is an, somebody's imagining of what African states might have looked like if Africa had not been colonized. How might, they, how might those states have developed? The middle one is, of course, the extent of the European empires. And thinking you know, within those blocks that are colored the same color, there was quite a large degree of freedom of movement and also quite a large degree of forced movement. Uh, forced recruitment of labor, which is amongst the things that has created challenges in the African context as well. And then on the right-hand side, we have the situation today, the, the, the state borders today. And that history gives particular, it's not unique to Africa. I would say it's, it's quite tempting to think of Africa having unique problems here. Lots of Asia have similar problems, but nonetheless, there are particular challenges in Africa just exemplified by those three maps. So who is statelessness? Who is stateless in Africa? If we go back to the definition, a person not considered as a national by any state under the operation of its law. And again, there's a sort of expert discussion of this, which you know, came to the conclusion that this is, in practice, a mixed question of fact and law. There are, as the law, there are gaps in the law that make people stateless. A Lebanese woman is working as a domestic worker in Saudi Arabia and is impregnated by her employer. Lebanon does not allow transmission of nationality through the woman. Saudi Arabia does not allow transmission of nationality outside, by a man outside marriage. The law. That child has no nationality. That's clear legal interpretation. But there are many cases where actually it's about administration. Theoretically, this child should have a nationality. In practice, can they claim it? A much more difficult question, and I'll come into that. So what are the gaps of the law in the African context? First of all, we have state succession at independence. Some countries had very clear rules on which, which people became nationals of the new states, and some didn't. In that gap, you fall, you, you know, uh, l large numbers of people have, uh, have fall. Those who are immigrants from outside the continent, but above all, those who are immigrants inside the country, especially people who had been forcibly transferred from one place to another by the colonial powers. We also have the same situation occurring again uh, in the context of Sudan, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Eritrea, with the new states there. People have fallen in the gaps of the laws. Um, the most important uh, gap in the law is the lack of rights attached to birth 
in the territory. And countries that have a purely dissent-based law particularly face uh, problems of statelessness. Gender discrimination is another key critical issue where uh, in the context if a father is foreign and the child is born in the mother's country, you get problems there as well. Different types of racial, uh, ethnic, religious discrimination. Dual nationality laws often misinterpreted. So the idea of somebody having a theoretical other nationality, um, that this person is, is not Ivorian because they're Burkina Bay, but they've never been to Burkina Faso. They've never claimed those documents. They might theoretically also have the right to that nationality, but this, in principle, Cote d'Ivoire would allow them to have both, but they're not, the rules are being misinterpreted and the, the law is not clear. Naturalization is very difficult to access in pretty much all African countries, including Egypt. Uh, you have some countries where the laws and the constitution conflict, so it's not clear. You've got different rules, and different state authorities interpret them differently. And we don't have a process to identify who is stateless and to determine, or who is at risk of statelessness, and to, and to determine which nationality they have. We also have gaps in the administration. Legal heritage of the different colonial powers makes a big difference to how the law is administered, which if you are born in the gap, you know, in the, the gap between, or the, the corner between Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, you have three different legal traditions that might apply to you. If you're an individual of an ethnic group that cuts those three borders, it's completely confusing as to what the rules are that might apply. We have a lack of effective civil registration. Uh, some countries have close to 100%. Uh, usually the smaller countries, but Liberia, 5% birth registration. Um, you know, that's, and in addition in Liberia, the laws and the constitution con conflict. Um, and and then, then many countries say that the only evidence that counts is civil registration, not just birth registration, but also marriage certificates, death registration. And if you don't have that, you can't access your documents. Lots of countries may have a theoretical protection for children of unknown parents, but they don't have any system to implement it. There's no, how do we make this happen? How do we ch give the, the child the document? Often conditions are, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of de devil in the detail of which documents you have to produce in order to get your national ID card. You have discrimination in practice, even if it's not there in the law. You have official fees, which are usually relatively modest in this area, but then of course there are lots and lots of unofficial fees that you might end up paying in order to facilitate the acquisition of a document. And then we have, in many countries, especially the former British territories, uh, a lack of proper independent or judicial oversight. So the trends in Africa, um, in the early, for initially after independence, we had a trend to reduce rights based on birth in the territory, uh, especially in the Commonwealth countries. More positively, since the 1990s, we've had a very strong trend to do two things. First, to reduce gender discrimination and to permit dual nationality, um, which I'll that we get more statistics later. Um, and then more recently, we've had a move to, in, to, to improve protections for children of unknown parents. And also, in some contexts, special naturalization initiatives. Uh, so Tanzania, for example, has naturalized a lot of Burundian refugees. There have been other uh, efforts in some other places to actually incorporate large bodies of people who are living in a country. They're clearly not going home. So actually, how can we regularize their status? So what do we have now? What is the current situation? This is a really complicated chart, uh, which it'll take you some time to read. But the summary uh, of this is that around half, a little bit more than half of African countries have reasonable rights based on birth in the territory. Very few have automatic rights just based on birth only, and those that do don't apply them that well. And some of them have restrictions based on uh, gen uh, based on different types of discrimination, ethnic or racial discrimination. Uh, but around, you know, either there's a right based, the, the absolute right, or a right based on birth and residence until majority, or a right based on birth and one of your parents was also born. And around half have a system that actually you, are, you, would, you aren't faced with a question of multi-generational statelessness, because actually people are incorporated into the bodies, uh, body of citizens. We have 15 countries, however, where the only protection is for children of abandoned parents, uh, abandoned children of unknown parents, 
Uh, and that's a very limited protection. There are not that many children where you don't know anything about the parents at all. And six countries have not even that protection. There's no, there's no right be, based on being born or found in the country. And obviously the, the risks of statelessness for children born in the country are highest where you have no rights based on uh, birth in the territory. Egypt falls in the, ca the second to last category, the category of 15 countries with no rights based on birth in Egypt except for children of unknown parents. So Egypt falls in the restrictive end of, this, uh, of, these, of these rules in terms of rights based on birth in, in, in Egypt. In terms of gender equality, we now have a very large majority, 54 countries, 43 now allow equal rights to transmit to children, whether born in the country or outside of the country, and 29, or rather fewer, equal rights to transmit to spouse. And Egypt kind of reflects this balance where we have since uh, 2004, we have gender equality, but in terms of children, but not yet in terms of uh, spouses. Uh, we have countries with racial, ethnic, and religious discrimination. Liberia and Sierra Leone, with their very particular histories as being countries founded by freed slaves, have racial discrimination built into the law. You can't be a citizen of Liberia at all, and in Sierra Leone, not from birth. Uh, if you are not, and the, the term used in, in Liberia is Negro, or in Sierra Leone, Negro African. There's a, there's a racial, uh, explicit racial, and one understands from the history where that comes from. Um, but it's, uh, in nowadays, that I think is, would not be seen as acceptable. We have ethnic discrimination in, uh, in, an, in half a dozen, it depends a bit, you know, these rules are you know, I've been working on this now for a decade, and every time you read a law, you have a different understanding of how it works and where is, where is the discrimination. But in Democratic Republic of Congo, in Nigeria, Somalia, South Sudan, Swaziland, Uganda, you have explicit terms in the law that either list, I mean, Uganda has a schedule to the Constitution where you have a list of around 40 or 50 ethnic groups. If you are born in Uganda and you are a member of one of those ethnic groups, as certified by a traditional leader, then you are automatically Ugandan. You don't have to prove anything about your parents. This operates inclusively to some extent. I mean, if you are a member of one of the listed groups, you're laughing. Um, but Asian Ugandans, when the constitution was revised to create this system, there was a big fight over the status of Asian Ugandans, and they are not included. So they are not on that list. Um, Democratic Republic of Congo just says an ethnic group established on the territory. The fight, you know, a lot of the civil war in Congo has been about what does established on the territory mean? Uh, and at different times since independence in 1960, that date has been 1960 itself. So if you were established in Congo in 1960, or if your ethnic group was established in 1960, and then it went to 1950, and then it went to 1908, and then it went to 1885. So somehow or other you had to demonstrate that you had origins going back to 1885, and now it's back at 1960. So that, a lot of the fights, the, the civil war in the east of Congo has been to some extent about that date, about, and especially around the status of the Rwanda-speaking populations. Egypt, the, the attribution of citizenship at birth doesn't have discrimination, but access to naturalization does. And if you, this is, these provisions around being of Egyptian origin or if the father was born in Egypt and belongs to a country where the majority of the inhabitants speak Arabic, or the religion is Islam, have preferential access to citizenship by naturalization. These terms actually go date back to the Treaty of Sèvres with the split breakup of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and when they were common provisions that were different parts of the Ottoman Empire had, had provisions that were similar to this. They, they have that history to them. Dual nationality, so we have now 28 countries in Africa with no restrictions on dual nationality at all. We have 17 countries which allow it sometimes. So either if you, you can be born with two nationalities and that's okay, or you can naturalize as a citizen and that's okay, or you can have two nationalities if you've got permission and that's okay. So it's, again, the kind of dual nationality or not, it is not a simple yes, no question. It, there, are, there are degrees of allowing dual nationality. And only nine do not allow in any case. Egypt has a very complicated provision here which uh, 
the, the law, you have to read the law several times to even begin to understand it. And of course, I'm reading it in English as well. Um, but it says first, you cannot obtain a foreign nationality without obtaining permission. So you think, well, that's clear. So that if you have obtained the foreign nationality without permission, that means that you must have lost Egyptian nationality. No, if you don't have permission, you still have Egyptian nationality. But, and in addition, the permission may include permission to keep Egyptian nationality. And this has been litigated in the British courts, for example, about whether somebody is, you know, is stateless or not, because they've acquired British nationality and Britain wants to take away their British nationality for you know, various reasons. And are they being made stateless because did they get permission and what did that include and so forth. So you have this very complicated question about whether whether dual nationality is allowed or not in Egypt. It appears not to be, but then on the other hand, if you, if you do acquire the other nationality, you will still be regarded as Egyptian. Uh, naturalization, um, the most common period in Africa uh, to, uh, to allow for nationality, acquisition of nationality based on long residence is five years of residence. This is in, an entirely theoretical number because almost nobody naturalizes. Um, and in practice, it's extremely discretionary. Uh, even in Nigeria, a country of 180 million people, you have a few hundred people a year naturalizing, a lot of them spouses. In fact, women marrying Nigerian citizens since they have gender discrimination in, in marriage. Um, and by comparison, 150,000 people naturalize in Britain annually. The largest number in Europe is in Spain, where it's something more than 200,000 naturalize each year. And even the numbers, the European countries that allow, that are relatively restrictive, it's still in the thousands. You know, Poland, a few thousand people naturalize each year. Um, we have these statistics because the European Union publishes them. And one of the problems here is that it's almost or never published. It's very, very difficult to find this out. Um, it's uh, the comparisons I'm giving from Europe are because uh, you know, the European Union publishes the information. In the African context, you're scrabbling through press, you know, presidential press releases, and, and uh, you know, you're lucky if you, if you can find it out. There have been some exceptional programs, which I've already mentioned. In Egypt, uh, the rule is 10 years residence. There are a set of conditions which are relatively common to other countries. Um, the requirement to be mentally sane and not have a disability is in strict contradiction of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities not to have that discrimination. Uh, Arabic language requirement, a relatively common requirement to have that type of thing in, in many different countries. Um, the ability to earn a living is sounds innocent but can be really problematic as well. How do you prove that, especially if you've been living in the informal sector? What types of proof count? Um, and we have a few hundred people a year, I understand, being, being uh, uh, naturalized as Egyptian. And many of those are, in fact, uh, historical uh, pre-2004 children of, of, of Egyptian mothers and Palestinian fathers who are naturalizing, uh, and, and that's a large percentage of those. So if you're not in that category, it's more difficult. Loss and deprivation, an increasingly topical uh, subject now, including in the UK, uh, which where I follow the news, nobody had their nationality deprived in Britain, you know, during the Second World War, like two people had their nationality taken away, when you'd have thought there would have been a lot of reasons to think about it in that context. Up until, you know, from immediately after the Second World War up until the 1990s, nobody, and then one or two a year, and now Britain has you know, deprived a few tens of people of, of nationality, um, but of naturalized citizens, that is. Most African, or sorry, around just under half, 22 African countries do not allow deprivation of nationality from birth. So if you are born a citizen, you cannot have your nationality taken away. Um, most of them do allow um, uh, deprivation from naturalized citizens. But since almost nobody naturalizes, the deprivation is kind of irrelevant. So in practice, most African countries have very strong protection uh, against, uh, against deprivation of nationality. Egypt is one of the exceptions. Egypt is really an outlier here uh, in terms of providing extremely wide grounds uh, to deprive a person of nationality. It's Eritrea is the only one that has somewhat similar terms. Uh, and we, there are, of course, uh, pr pr proposals to increase those powers as well.
So who is left stateless by all of this comparative law and rather detailed protection, rather detailed provisions? Um, on the first context, we have you know you can you can do three basic categories: migrants, of course. You know, statelessness is in essence a a consequence of migration. It's not a necessary consequence of migration, but people who are born in the country where six generations of their ancestors have been born and they've not moved and they their parents were married and they've lived in the same community, are, even if they have no documents at all, are unlikely to be stateless. In the African context, it's the pre-independence migrants who are particularly at risk. And more generally, the children are very long-term migrants, including those who arrived in the 60s and so forth. We have cases where people who, who've returned, or they haven't themselves returned, but they've, their parent, they've returned to a country of their parents. So for example, in the context of conflict in the Central African Republic, large number of people of West African origin had been born and brought up in the Central African Republic. And in the context of fleeing from violence there, they thought, well, we'll go to my, the country of my father. And having arrived there, couldn't prove that they had any connection. And so you have people who have not been recognized. Former refugees, refugees in general are at risk of statelessness, but especially where the refugee situation has been declared to be over. So in the African context, Angolans, Rwandans, Liberians, and Sierra Leoneans, who used to have refugee status, but when the refugee status comes to an end, they are not, you know, then the time comes to be repatriated, UNHCR will facilitate their return home or facilitate them being able to stay where they are. And the authorities of their country where they came from says, we don't know this person. And there are, we have a few thousands of people, at least that we know of, at least in West Africa, and probably others as well who are seriously in problems there. More generally, the map, those three maps I showed you, people, you know, ethnic groups who've been divided by colonial borders are substantially at risk because both sides will say, no, you're really from that side. No, you're really from that side. And you, you struggle with that. It's not, it's a gap in administration, um, but uh, rather than in law, but it's very real. People who follow a nomadic lifestyle are badly underserved by nationality laws that are framed on European models, which really pay no attention to the existence of, of nomadism at all, and zones where borders have changed, which is a different form of state succession. So the Nigeria-Cameroon border, for example, has changed, and you've got a few, maybe 100,000 people who don't, it's not clear now if they're Nigerian or Cameroonian. And fi the final category is the, is the vulnerable children. So the first set here, the foreign father born out of wedlock and unknown parents, those are gaps in the law where people are left vulnerable by gender discrimination, by discrimination based on birth in and out of wedlock, or by the absence of a pr protection for children whose parents are not known. And then the second set of, of the orphans, the child workers separated from their parents, the trafficked, the, those who are subjected to forced child marriage. Uh, are usually in the law, they would have a nationality, but proving it and getting the documents is a different question. So how many are stateless? In Africa, we have, uh, you know, well, globally at least 10 million. This is a number for which uh, there isn't any really scientific basis. And if you look at the statistics here for Cote d'Ivoire, uh, for statistics here for Africa, uh, you know, Cote d'Ivoire has the largest number, largely because, you know, at a certain point, that was reported by the government and it's become the figure, but it's also not based on anything. And you look at the statistics, uh, it's not based on nothing, but it's based on not a, serious, uh, not a serious investigation. And if you look at those statistics, you can see that the imbalance here just proves that we have very little idea about how many people are stateless. And in particular, in the African context, where many people have no documents, not all undocumented people are stateless. Not all stateless people are undocumented. And the, the gap in between that, understanding what is going on, is where the confusion about statistics. Um, and just finally, it's very common to think about statelessness as being something that occurs to people who are outside their own country, uh, who, who are either in a sort of refugee type context or they're migrants of some sort. But most stateless people are in their own country. They're in the country that they were born and brought up in and they're not recognized as nationals of that country. And that's almost where the statistics become even more challenging. So who are the groups that of, who are at risk of statelessness in Egypt? The best known community is clearly the Palestinians here, but we have a number of others who are 
coming out of situations uh, in Africa or in the neighborhood. Kurdish Syrians struggle to be recognized as Syrians in many cases. We have people of South Sudanese origin now in Sudan who are not recognized as Sudanese and have no connections really to South Sudan. People of Eritrean origin in Ethiopia. And we have an increasing number, which I think our research project is going to be looking at, about people who are born in Egypt who struggle to obtain nationality as well. Very quickly, the last couple of slides, just to say, to move to kind of regional human rights regimes, because I think what's interesting is if, you know, at the beginning I looked at what's the international law regime here, and saying there's the beginnings of trying to put some limits on state dis discretion, but still quite a reluctance to really challenge state discretion around their ability to decide who is a national. But the African uh, regional human rights system has actually been much more forceful on this. There is no provision on nationality in the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. However, Article 5 talks about the right to dignity and legal status. And the African Commission has had a series of cases in which they have essentially interpreted that and other provisions relating to due process, the right to family life, and so forth, to say that includes the right to a nationality. The Protocol on the Rights of Women is problematic. It essentially says discrimination shall in the nationality shall not be allowed except if national law says that it is allowed. And it was the North African countries at that time which in essence made that protocol rather weak. But again, we have a movement in the last uh, a few years to, to, to actually make much stronger statements around the right to a nationality. The African um, Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child provides the right to a name, birth registration, and nationality. And again, the committee of experts on the rights and welfare of the child has decided a couple of cases that are important, um, or decided one case relating to uh, Kenyan children of Nubian origin and their uh, discrimination in the Kenyan context, uh, and there are other cases that are actually before them but have not yet been decided. And they've, they've adopted a general comment about this point as well. The League of Arab States has statements which are a bit more like international law. You have a right to a nationality, but which country has the obligation to give nationality is not quite clear. And then finally, we have at the international level uh, a very strong a campaign that was launched in 2014 by UNHCR to end statelessness in 10 years, so by 2024, with a focus on a range of different legal reforms, uh, administrative reforms, and efforts to uh, naturalize populations, large populations known to be a stateless, known to be stateless. We have separately, but in a very related way, the Sustainable Development Goals have a target around providing legal identity for all. Um, we have a very strong push to improve birth registration, which again is very significant as a step to increase documentation. And finally, and really quite innovatively, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights has adopted a draft protocol on the eradication of statelessness in Africa, of which the first state parties meeting was held just last month. And so there's a, a which, if this document is adopted in the form that it now exists, will be a really quite radical departure at, at, in, in international law in terms of trying to provide stronger rights uh, and protections, uh, stronger rights to individuals and stronger protections against statelessness. Of course, the states have a lot of opportunity to change the text as adopted by the African Commission, but it is a very interesting initiative um, that will, would you know, require, for example, quite substantive revisions to the Egyptian nationality law, but also in some other countries as well. And I will stop there. I've gone on for rather too long. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Bronwyn. Um, so a number of, uh, thank you, for, it was fascinating, and a number of um, questions came to mind for me, but um, I might um, save them and see if there are questions from the, from the audience um, first. I would just say that um, it is particularly interesting to hear what she has to say in the context of what we're trying to work on in, in, in the project. Um, and, you know, how sensitive this topic is. And, you know, not just in Egypt, but in any country. How many things that do not necessarily make any rational sense are sort of attached to nationality and citizenship laws. Um, and, and, and why that is the case is, uh, is, 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 you know, 
quite an interesting question in and of itself. Um, and Australia is going through a whole yes. set of history right now about dual nationality of politicians, which is a common yes, that's discussion, right. exactly. That's right. Um, because, of course, this is a high priority issue for Australia right now. But for some reason, we are obsessed with the nationality issue. Deprivation of mm -hmm. citizenship as well in Australia. So, um, yeah, so I, I think that... Um, it's, it's not an easy field in, in which to work because it's such a hot button issue. Um, whereas often uh, quite small administrative or procedural changes can deliver so much to people's lives because you can see what's at stake here. Um, yet on the other side, there, there are some quite irrational sensitivities, sometimes rational, but sometimes irrational sensitivities attached to, this, attached to these issues. Um, okay, so let's open it up for questions. Uh, anyone want to? Sorry. So, so aside from the Palestinian issue, which is a you know very politicized issue, I'm wondering with the sort of increasing protracted refugee crises and you know births of you know refugee children uh, in in North Africa, um, yeah, like concretely, what are some of the uh, strategies or, or, or remedies that are being devised to address the issue of statelessness, or e or even um, I mean, in sub-Saharan Africa, have there been successful cases of like groups of people petition, you know, being able to basically succeed in acquiring nationality? Uh, maybe we'll take uh, two or three questions and then Fran can address them in a group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent uh, talk. Uh, could you let us know why there are refugees in Madagascar and Zimbabwe, and uh, and is the Eritrean Ethiopian conflict still going on? Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, okay, so if not, then I'll have Branwen answer them, and we'll take another round. So if you think of anything to ask, yeah. um, so first on the the you know what are the, what have been some successful initiatives there are kind of two levels of initiative one is the kind of at the very individual level can we ensure birth registration including for refugees for example and so uh, the you know that can we at least preserve the future the right of the child to claim the nationality of the parents even if they have no rights where they are born and that at a kind of in child by child basis can be very significant and important the challenge there is that uh, often nationality laws state that the facts relating to the child's birth have no legal validity unless they are the birth was registered according to civil registration, and if the child was born outside the country, they have to that birth registration in the other country has to be transcribed via the consular authorities into the register of the of the country of the child's parents, and that you know no you know very large numbers of people would not even think of doing that. Just like you know, if you've, I've got the birth registration, why else do I need? More so that that kind of the, and consular authorities just don't you know if you are a, the sort of person who knows that that's what you have to do you can get it done but actually they don't go out trying to help that that's a real gap and I think you know that's one of the areas that I think with our research project I'd really like to emphasis on the obligation of consular authorities to actually try to assist their nationals to both recover, the, for the adults to recover citizenship and for the children to be registered. Now for refugees, of course, that's a real problem because they're not going to, they're not going to approach their consular authority. So then how does one think about that? And if one looks to start off with a negative example, um, the Liberian refugees, when the cessation clause was invoked, uh, the Liberian uh, authorities sent 
you know, teams around to the country, different countries in West Africa, and people applied to be recognized as Liberian, either to be moved home or to be given a Liberian passport to enable them to stay where they were. And, you know, even a, a, re a registration with UNHCR was not accepted as being evidence that you were Liberian. Um, it wasn't sufficient. And so people were asked questions like, you know, who is your traditional leader and sing the national anthem and, um, you know, that, those types of questions. Uh, and of course, you know, some of these were talking about children who were born outside the country who were left when they were two, who don't speak Liberian English, who speak, you know, the, you know, and, that, and, and you have around something over a thousand known people who are rejected by the Liberians as being Liberian and who are, you know, that the UNHCR is trying to intervene. More positively, that the, the big positive examples is that uh, um, Liberia has, in fact, given naturalization to some Sierra Leonean refugees. They've, they've incorporated some. The biggest example is Tanzania. Um, which has naturalized around 120,000 Burundian refugees dating from the 1970s. Process has not been perfect, inevitably, but nonetheless, that has, that has gone ahead. Uh, more in a different context, Kenya, just quite recently, within the last year, has naturalized a few thousand uh, Makonde who are from Mozambique, but they're not refugees, they're migrants. They came to work on tea plantations uh, in the 50s. Uh, and sisal plantations, different plantations, and Kenya has, uh, you know, actually, after a lot of campaigning by national civil society and by UNHCR, has given them documents. So there are pockets of, of cases where people have done that, but it's not, it's, it's a work in progress. Globally, there are other examples as well. So tea plantation workers in Sri Lanka coming from India, of Indian origin, uh, have been naturalized as Sri Lankan. Uh, you know, there are a number of other cases like that as well, where there are some positive examples. Um, but it's, uh, you know, there is more bad news than good, I would have to say. But there is some good news. Um, the question about refugees in Zimbabwe, so there are the Zimbabwean, or the other countries as well, Zimbabwe and Madagascar, Ethiopia, Eritrea, I think were the three situations mentioned. The Zimbabweans are mostly not recognized as refugees anymore. Um, some of them were, um, but mostly not. The vast majority, the largest number who've left Zimbabwe are in South Africa, and South Africa has given them a special temporary status, uh, a sort of absolutely sui generis status for Zimbabweans, because they just rec recognized that, on the one hand, most of them were not refugees, they were, uh, but on the other hand, they were not going back to Zimbabwe, and it was much better to know who they were and to give them a document than it was to have they were not, you know, there was no way they could all be deported. Uh, and so, you know, just recognizing the reality. Um, uh, so, th but, you know, the, and, you know, increasingly elsewhere, I think Zimbabweans are not being recognized as, as refugees. There is a large population of stateless people in Zimbabwe, or at least a population at major risk of statelessness, who are largely the descendants of uh, farm workers who were bought, brought by the British or the white minority regime to work on farms from Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia, uh, and have were recognized as Zimbabwean without problem until they started voting for the opposition, at which time it was discovered that in the context where dual nationality was not allowed, that they never renounced their other nationality. And so you had the situation where people would go along and they'd say, well, I, you know, I've never been to Malawi. I don't know anything about Malawi. I don't speak any Malawian languages. So they'd go along to the Malawian embassy and say, I want to renounce my Malawian nationality. And the Malawian embassy would said, you can't renounce your Malawian nationality. We don't know who you are. And so then they would, but they would still, the Zimbabwean authorities would say, yes, but look at your last name. Obviously, you're Malawian. Uh, and so people were trapped in that situation. Um, Ethiopia, Eritrea, the, I mean, the conflict is over, clearly. You, the situation there is not so much about, uh, I mean, there are refugees from Eritrea related to the situation in Eritrea, but it's not anymore about the conflict with Ethiopia. But you have a large number of people of Eritrean origin in Ethiopia who are not recognized as Ethiopian related to the politics of the Ethiopia-Eritrea uh, situation. And the situation has improved in Ethiopia, but there are still quite a large number of people who, are, who have connections, especially through the father, to, to Eritrea, who are not recognized as Ethiopian and who are therefore stateless. Uh, Madagascar, the, 
the, the, the stateless, pop Madagascar doesn't have too many refugees, but it does have quite a substantial stateless population who are people of Indian origin who, were, who again came as, as migrant labor during the colonial period. And interestingly, there is a little British-French uh, uh, problem there in that the British, because India being a British territory and Madagascar being a French territory, the British insisted that they should not be made for, into French people. Uh, and so they were not recognized as French at that time. Uh, and then they've remained not recognized as Madagascan as well. Uh, and so that's the a population of a few tens of thousands of people who struggle to be recognized as Madagascan. Um, you know, then there are these populations all over the place. Um, you know, big one in Congo, as I've already mentioned, um, but many, you know, Cote d'Ivoire has a large number there, you know, and then often, the large numbers of people are people who were moved before the colonial period. When the new country gained its sovereignty, they were not recognized, and their children are not recognized. And if you have rights based on birth in the territory, eventually this population evaporates, because even if the parents were not recognized, the children. But if you have a purely descent-based rule, then you have a multi-generational statelessness, people not recognized. Uh, more questions? One in the back. Hi, my name is Cinderella Hassan. I have one question over the binding mechanism in the Convention Against Statelessness. Mm -hmm. And aside of political willingness, is there anything that actually obliges states to meet their obligations uh, towards the end of statelessness? Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, the statelessness conventions do not have the admittedly weak but nonetheless existing mechanisms that exist around the human rights uh, treaty. So there is no similar treaty. There is no seemingly similar treaty monitoring body for either of the two conventions. UNHCR has the mandate for stateless persons um, and have done this campaign. Um, but they've only started really taking statelessness seriously in about the last 10 years. Up until then, they didn't really do much on statelessness, and it's, they've been done, done much no, more now. So, uh, in essence, you, we, there are some procedures at the UN level. There's a discussion, there are a set of resolutions around deprivation of nationality, but states resist extremely heavily the idea that this is not a matter of their own discretion. And the treaty bodies around non-discrimination uh, and as I say, the you know, Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child at the African level has been strong on this, but the, the mechanisms are weak and there isn't really, a, you know, for the statelessness conventions themselves, there is, there is no mechanism. Uh, any other questions? Well, I have a question that's kind of related to what you were asking, actually. about So before the 51 Refugee Convention, as I understand it, some countries at least were treating the two groups of people in very similar ways. Um, so, and, and now, as you say, UNHCR does have the mandate over this, um, and that took a while to happen. And you know, so they've had the mandate since the 1970s, but they've only really okay. acted, acted on it in the last 10 years. Yeah. Um, so, in fact, since the Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness came into force, in fact. So, and I, and I remember, so reading the travel preparatoire of the Refugee Convention, there, there was a lot of debate about whether to te treat the two groups of people uh, differently. The idea being um, that both sets of people have an absence of state protection, uh, but in one case there's an absence of a state, in the other case there's a state that's unwilling or unable. Um, do we distinguish them legally? Um, Given that that's now happened, do you think that a solution to this problem, not just institutionally in terms of saying UNHCR, well, you take care of, you're, they're a person of concern for you, um, would be to move the protected, because the regime under the stateless persons um, convention is, is much weaker, the protections are weaker. Um, the entitlements are weaker, everything is weaker. So uh, given that the problem is increasing, given that the reduction idea hasn't really worked, would it perhaps be better to collapse it, not just institutionally, but legally, the two regimes, go back to the way it was before? Would that? Um, I think, I mean, there's a huge nervousness in general, as you well know, about even touching the <laughs> Refugee Convention, yeah. because anything that we get is likely to be worse. Um, in terms of protections for the individual's concern. So just on that ground, I think probably not. I think, however, that 
I mean, the real solution here is actually about attacking discretion on nationality rather than providing protection for stateless persons. I think for, for almost all people, most, as I say, most people who are stateless are stateless in the country where they were born and brought up. And actually the protection that they need is the nationality of that country. Or if that is not available, at least it needs to be assured that they have a nationality of another country. Um, and that, uh, you know, at, at least, you know, the obligation on states to collaborate to say, this person, they are either Burkina Bay or, Cote or Ivorian. It's one or the other. They're not Mongolian. Which is it? And not just to say, oh, we're not sure they're Ivorian. Well, we're not sure if they're Burkina Bay. We're not sure if they're Rwandan. We're not sure if they're Congolese. We're not sure, you know. And actually to say, at minimum, that states have the obligation to collaborate and say, this person belongs to you or to us. Which is it? Um, and to, act, to regularize that, which I think is probably politically more acceptable than saying, you know, so the, but, but, but ultimately, there's a point where you say, three, four, five, how many generations before this person is not from here? I mean, the, how, how long can you carry on insisting that uh, is also a problem. Yeah, um, so I, I think that it is more politically realistic to do what mm -hmm. you suggested. But the thing is that even that is not really happening. Yeah, especially because um, of the most difficult situations is like, you know, Sudan and South Sudan, they could very well have agreed that. It would have been perfectly possible for them to agree. And th there was a framework agreement for them to agree between the two of them. But the politics in that context you know, meant that there was no agreement. Yeah. So the other thing, it's not so much a question, but an observation that the, the history of this is quite interesting. Not, not statelessness per se, but the history of nationality and citizenship mm. is, is really interesting. Um, the way we, we, we're used to it today is a relatively new phenomenon. Um, but it, it actually did become, it, it started becoming a thing in the context of building your empire, because mm. it was a control issue, you know, saying, I give a royal charter to this company to go there, and they need to be my company. There yeah. needs to be a link with the government. Um, and then in that context, the rights of aliens started becoming, it's, it's not the rights of aliens that we've talked about today. In that case, the rights of aliens were really strong, because you would say, this charter company went to the Americas, or the Indies, as they thought they were back then. Um, and um, it has certain rights as, as an alien, because the, the alien has the right to come to your country in peace and to trade. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and within the context of empire, we can move forced labor around, enslaved labor around, or, or even voluntarily citizens can move around. So all kinds of things were asserted as, as, as a, the strong right of an alien. Um, as opposed to the way we think of it now as a... <laughs> no, I mean, it's still the, the kind of, you know, consular protection is still a really strong form of human rights protection. I mean, if you... Yeah. Yeah, and, of course, it depends whose embassy. I mean, if, you're, right. if you, you know, <laughs> consular protection from the Congolese embassy is a different thing from consular protection from the U.S. embassy, clearly. Yeah. But, but even, the, you know, even then, having the Congolese... At least, even if, in theory, the Congolese might intervene on your behalf, you're still better off than if nobody recognizes you. Right. Yeah, but I was thinking now in terms of, so wanting to assert, to give nationality to entities because that was actually an incentive, it was to the advantage of the state. But now to, to come all the way to 2017 to have countries saying, well, we're going to withdraw nationality as a punishment um, seems actually quite strange because wouldn't it actually, I mean, it, it, with that logic in mind, wouldn't you want to keep control over the people that you found particularly problematic, <laughs> rather than you know saying, well, you're no longer Australian. I, I actually would feel safer if they remained Australian. <laughs> no, and that's the strong. I think that is the strongest argument to say that you know you're depriving people who've gone to you know to fight for ISIS or exactly. whatever. You actually feel safer with them wandering around the Middle East and, and with you know, no state control. With them. no state control. Would you actually rather have them under close surveillance in Britain or yeah. Yeah. you know Egypt or wherever? Um, yeah. You know, it's uh, you know, and Britain has has kind of led the way on this in a rather unfortunate way. Um, it's been <laughs> been the most deprivations in the sort of modern era. Um, oh, really? In the in the European context, I think Egypt is up there. I was well. going to say we're. <laughs> I think that Egypt is yeah. is is on the way to. Yeah. 
So, because there is a lot of discussion right now on deprivation in Egypt. Yeah, and the thing, I mean, um, one has to distinguish as well, though. There are, you know, there's deprivation for other reasons as well, for fraud, for example. Yeah. And so there is quite commonly deprivation because the person lied in their application form. Uh, and that could include lying about a relatively trivial criminal offence, for example. And there's a whole set of jurisprudence around was the fraud material? Is deprivation a proportionate response to that? The, the terrorism deprivations are rather a limited category, the kind of serious, uh, you know, threat to the state. But then, you know, you have this question of the, you know, you effectively you can, you can deprive nationality from somebody, you know, if you're saying I'm not going to make a person stateless, you're creating a two-tier citizenship where only somebody who is a naturalized citizen in, a, in essence, because they have a right to another nationality, can be deprived, whereas others cannot. Um, um, okay, so I have a, some more questions, no. but does anyone else okay. have anything they want to add? Oh, okay, you have a hand back there? Okay. No? Plus? Okay. No. <laughs> well, I'm actually asking about the, uh, if there's an, in, any official response from uh, Egypt about the IPLON campaign. Uh, whether it's going to implement it or not, and if there is any response from the UNSCR Egypt about implementing it in Egypt? I don't Hopefully. know. I don't know what the Egyptian response has been, actually. I mean, I, I, do, you, do you know? I don't know if there's been an, a, an official interaction. I mean, part of the campaign has been for ratification of the two conventions, and Egypt was not. Um, so, th but th that, but there has been. I mean, the, the two statelessness conventions have been amongst the had amongst the lowest level of ratifications, but they are increasing. I mean, over the last ten years, they've increased a, a great deal. So we we're now up in the around 70 or 80 or so for the state the reduction of statelessness, and rather more for the status of stateless persons. It's I think you know uh, providing a status of stateless person is relatively politically unproblematic because there are lots of ways of controlling that process. The reduction of statelessness is, is more challenging f for states. Um, but, uh, I mean, you know, Britain, for example, which ratified the convention relating to the stateless status of stateless persons back in 1954, only put in place a procedure like, three years ago. Um, and, you know, and, and around, I think there have been around a thousand or so applications, and a few hundred people have been given status. Um, but it's a relatively small number in the UK. Uh, any other? Okay, so my, my final, it's, it's not really a question, but again, observations on, um, so I, I understand what you mean that the place to focus would be uh, nationality laws and the gaps there in terms of addressing this problem. Um, but not just in Africa, but globally, given that we don't have statistics, my feeling being in this region is that the problem is increasing. Some of maybe that's because of some of the things that Paris too was saying, which is that you know the the bigger displacements, and we see people in such protracted situations, and we know people that this is happening to, so we feel like it's increasing. Um, but uh, is is that actually the case? I mean, if more people, more, more states are ratifying. Uh, particularly the reduction of statelessness convention, which is sort of put forward as the main thing you need to do as yeah, part yeah. of this campaign, um, then, you know. There has been some success there. So within, you know, the, well, the Americas are pretty good on this stuff. There's a kind of one exception, which is the Dominican Republic, which has oh, been yeah. very bad. But otherwise, the Americans, the Americas in general, North and South, they pretty, they, they have a good record. Uh, Europe is mixed you know, the European Union and the Council of Europe more generally, the UNHCR campaign is having an impact. There have been some naturalizations. There's definitely been efforts to reduce statelessness. Some of the largest populations there are people dispersed amongst the former Soviet Union. So it's again, it's a state succession problem. So it's Russian speakers or people from who are, who are outside their kind of kin state. So Uzbeks in Kazakhstan, Kazakhs in Uzbekistan, Russian speakers in the Baltic states, Roma everywhere because nobody likes the Roma, and they've got oh, lots of states have taken the opportunity to say we don't want you. Um, but again, there has been progress around that efforts to try and reduce that. In the African context, I think there is a very wide recognition that this is an issue that needs to be sorted. I mean, talking to state representatives. There's a, actually a sense that 
you, know, you can't not recognize this as an issue, and that the vast majority of people affected are Africans who are in Africa. You know, it's, they're not foreigners in that sense, you know, they're, they're, and which, you know, the dynamic in North Africa may be a little more difficult there as it is in, in Europe in some context. So I think there is a recognition that this is an issue that needs to be dealt with. But the numbers is really difficult because the numbers is, you know, if you are a nomadic pastoralist and you've never bothered to get any papers, because really what's the point? Yeah, you can cross the border with some money, you're not planning on sending your children to formal schooling, you know, your entire life is, is just doesn't interact much with the modern state, and insofar as it does, you can use money and connections to sort it out. But actually, I mean, one of the issues here is that just the requirements to show identification and to have a document are becoming so much more prevalent that, in yeah. fact, all sorts of people who previously didn't have documents but it didn't really bother them too much yeah. are now finding that they have to have documents. And so you, you're kind of discovering stateless populations that you didn't even know were there. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean this is a, a minor case, but even in Canada, you know, you used to be able to cross the U.S. border relatively easily. You didn't need a passport, and then you did, and now you need more than that. And um, and you know, f people don't realize, but the, actually, the Canada-U.S. border has not actually stayed that fixed in certain places. So <laughs> you know, yeah. Were, yeah. yeah. No, and, and Brexit has got a, 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 a throwing this issue up hugely. I mean, there are lots and lots of children of European citizens born in Britain who, under British law, are British, but because their parents were settled, there's a term used in British law, if you're, if you're born in Britain and your parents were settled in Britain, and of course there's a lot of definition around that, but of course they have no proof that they were settled in Britain because they didn't need a work permit. They didn't need any permission to be in Britain, so there's no proof. So we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of children who prob actually are British under the law, but there's no evidence. And that's a huge challenge. And then meantime, the kind of political environment that's come yeah. with Brexit and with general a kind of xenophobic mood in the country is a requirement to show identification. Britain has never had a national ID card. But increasingly, hospitals, schools, and so forth are being turned into immigration authorities. Yeah. And the people who don't have ID documents in Britain, around 20% of people living in Britain don't have a passport, which is really the only ID document that exists. And who, you know, they are the poor people. They are the mad people. They are the drug addicts. They are the people who, who are at the margins of society. And suddenly, they are being told, well, you know, you have to have a document to do this, that, and the other. And, you know, that's... You know, the, the whole requirement to have ID is, is, you know, you say, well, they're obviously British under the law, but if you can't get the document, it's right. kind of irrelevant. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, the increase of governmentality and all of these, yeah, I, I was, it's, it's happening. I mean, we, we tend to think of it um, as an issue in the South, I suppose, because that's where we are and that's the context in which we're thinking about it. But it is an issue in the North. I mean, I've, I've seen it happen in Australia because it, they, you, they end up targeting essentially that, the South in the North, the yes. poorest people in those societies, um, and ends up not being particularly an issue for the North in the South. Right? So the wealthy of Egypt are not sitting there worried about this. Um, so yeah, it... Um, no, I mean, there's yeah. a kind of almost precise overlap between people who have dual nationality and the people who are stateless. And if you're poor, you're stateless. If you're rich, you have dual nationality, in essence, because it's the people who have connections in many different places. If you are wealthy and you have all the documents and you have access to the procedures, you will get two or three or <laughs> however many passports. But if you are a poor person with no education and your birth wasn't registered and da 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 da, yeah. you will end up stateless. Right. Well, on that cheerful... <laughs> Note, um, as our seminars always end on a cheerful note, yeah. <laughs> um, let's uh, call it a day and let's thank Bronwyn for her talk. Yeah.